just want you to know I appreciate you. I don't need to say anything about anything else about anyone else. I just want you to know how much I appreciate you. And uh, we've been talking about uh, no facade. Uh, I want to be care. I, and somebody said to me last week, uh, it, it was Dennis. I don't mind Dennis Collins. Dennis said, well, you, you were being careful. And I said, I, you know, I was being careful because uh, I'm not the guy who wants to throw somebody on, under the bus because they don't agree with something they believe. And, uh, and so when I'm talking about, we're talking about being religious right now, calling it no facade. And, uh, and so I, I, I will again, because, you know, you, you'd, you'd rather speak the truth and, and say things that are a benefit to people and, uh, rather than just blatantly offend them. And, and then the person, you know, then people not listen to anything else that, you, you know, that you'd have to say. And so, there, you know, there's time and place for anything. I, I'm, I'm never, I don't like, you know, the courage or something like that. Uh, I just want to, you know, you speak the truth with love and grace. And then, and then that's all you can do if you speak it with love and grace. You can be bold with it. You can be straight. But uh, if you do it with love and grace, then, you know, uh, then you've, you've done, I believe, what the Lord would require of us. And so I'm, I'm taking a text from 2 Timothy. Again, we're calling this no facade. Taking a text from 2 Timothy, the third chapter. I'm going to begin once again where I did last week, try to get through the front part of it pretty quick. And, uh, you know, some of it, it's, you know, it's just kind of hard to sometimes pick right up in the middle of where you got done. I had so many uh, notes and things to say last week, I couldn't get through them. And so 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. It's a text that you hear a lot right now in the day and time we live in. And uh, uh, these, you know, there, there are some difficulty concerning the times. So Paul says this, but mark this, the terrible times will come. Some translations say difficult times will come. Uh, the King James and the New King James say perilous times will come. Here's, here's what that word terrible, all right? Because it says, as I walk through this and get to the point in the, in the verse that I want to emphasize, because you understand it's all important. It's the word of God. But, you know, you can't preach the whole Bible every time. You know, you, you guys would come back. And uh, uh, let's see. <laughs> who was it? A wise old preacher told me one time, said, said the heart can only can, and can receive what the, what the bottom can endure. All right. Reducing. All right. It means this. Terrible means to reduce, reducing strength. So that is, that is what these things do in relationship. You, we, we, we understand he's talking about collectively what the culture will be like. And, uh, and, and it will take its toll. It begins to, you, and I want you to think about this in the day and time we live in. It, what, uh, when you begin to hear about people who are lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boaster, proud, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiveness, and slandering, those can things take your toll. They, what, they begin to reduce in strength. And what? And I'm talking about spiritually. Begin to reduce in strength spiritually and probably emotionally too. Without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. And then we come to this. In the, man, when you think about that list of things, you know, we're talking about people who are brutal, treacherous, conceited, unholy, ungrateful, in the midst, slanderous, in the midst of all that, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Have nothing to do with them. Now, Again, I go back to that reducing in strength, having a form of godliness, but what? But denying its power. To what? To reduce in strength. So when there's just a form of godliness, all right, we'll just, we'll just tagline it right now. We're talking about just, just being purely religious. You know, the Bible does say there is a place for pure religion undefiled. Well, that's, that's pretty specific, pure, pure religion undefiled. But can I tell you, most religion in the world is very defiled. Very defiled. You know, people say, well, there's not much difference in the religions of the world. You haven't traveled. You haven't traveled. There's a lot of difference in the religions of the world. And if you're a female, you really need to believe what I'm saying. Because it, it is only the influence of Christianity that has changed the world and the culture to such a state that 
that we are able to say there's neither Jew nor Greek nor bond nor free nor male nor female for all are one in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd like for some of them just to you know, run over there to some of those countries like India or Nepal and tell them about your rights. Yeah, they got a, they, yeah, they got a form of godliness. There's no power to what? To change a life. Because that's what I want to focus on. They will act as if they're religious. I'm using New, New Living Translation. I like to look at lots of translations for, for the sake of clarity because, you know, the, you know, the people who do translations, they're, they're, they're all linguistic scholars. And those who do the New Testament, especially in, in, in Greek, and those who do the uh, Old Testament, especially in, in uh, Aramaic and Latin, or, or Aramaic and Hebrew. And so, uh, so I, like, I like this. It says they'll act as if they're religious, but they reject power, the power that can make them godly. Uh, obviously, you can be very religious, and if you reject Christ, that is the only one who can make you godly. But you can even say, well, you know, I'm, I, I'm a Christian, but show disrespect to the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, or the fatherhood of God. You know, today they want to they make God genderless. That's silly. It's just silly. If God says he's a father, he's a father. And if he said he sent his son, he sent his son. I, let's just, just, just believe it the way you... Listen, I, that doesn't bother me. I, 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 you talk about a guy who has high potential for being a male chauvinist. My potential is really high. It's way up here. Way up here. But you know what? I proudly say I'm a part of the bride of Christ. I'm proud to be a part of the bride. Well, see, I'm saying if, the word, if that's what the word says, receive it. Believe it. All right? So... I overcome my high potential for, for regard for the word. Galatians 5.1. Christ has set us free to live a free life. It's good instruction. Paul's writing to the Galatian church. So stand your ground. They're struggling. Never again let anyone put a harness of slavery on you. Now I got, I got born again in May of 1975 at a little church that's not, not no longer open right now down the road Bethel Chapel some local folks good folks have bought the property they they've hopes to turn it back into a church I'm for them I'm for them you know hope hope goes well okay but man I got saved there now uh, did you get saved there Jim yeah, Jim God, man we we would have you know uh, you know the oldest person in our church has roots there Margie Doherty Margie Doherty boy she's a jewel she's a treasure and, uh, and, but, but anyway, fond, fond, wonderful, fond memories. But I, I got saved there. Now, not, nobody's fault there, but after I got saved, Bill, all right, after a period of time, I got very religious. I got very religious. I, you know, uh, I, 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 I tell people, you know, golly, we'd ne I, there was no going to the grocery store on Sunday. No, no, you could not go to the grocery store on Sunday. And, uh, uh, and you know, or buy gas. Oh, I wouldn't buy gas on Sunday. You know? Now, that didn't, didn't make me a bad guy, all right? Well, I'm not saying I was a bad person, but you know what? I had, I'd left one form of being in bondage to something, which, you know, before that, just, I was just a, you know, I was just a sinner, and sinner do sin, you know, they do sinful things, all right? And so that's just where I want, what, you know, was. You know, I, was I was lost. I wasn't the worst lost person. I was just a lost person. And, uh, and so here I, here I am. I, got, I, get, I get set free from this stuff. And my, my life did change. All my friends talked about, boy, Bill's life's changed. And, you know, and that's what Jesus does. Jesus changes lives, you know. And uh, so I got saved and my life changed. And, and then for a period of time, I didn't stay there forever. But for a period of time, I got, I got real religious for a period of time. And you know what I did? I, man, he set me free, and I, I didn't know how to take a stand. I, I didn't understand I was getting religious. Oh, gosh, critical of everybody, you know, because they weren't as religious as I was. <laughs> you know, I was a baby Christian. I, you know, wished I could have understood that then, but I didn't. Take your stand. Never again let anyone put a harness of slavery. Now, I, I, I like communicating here. There's a reason that Paul has this, 
this, uh, this is a great defense. Of, that is what Galatians is. Galatians is a great defense of grace. That's what the book's written about. It's a great defense of grace. Now, you know, it's not the message of grace that's taught out here in some circles of the charismatic movement where, you know, uh, you don't have to repent of sin and the grace of God covers it. And Then there's another community where everybody's going to heaven. Listen, I, I get where somebody might like that, but a just God can't do that. Can't happen. But it is a great defense of grace. Because grace gives us what we don't deserve. All right? Now, God's merciful. He delivered us from what we did deserve, but grace gives us what we do not deserve. And so Paul's making this great defense of grace because there's a group that follows Paul everywhere he goes, and they're called Judaizers. And they followed him everywhere because he, they couldn't make disciples themselves, so what they did was steal disciples. And so everywhere Paul went, these, there were those who followed Paul, and what they endeavored to do was when they got people saved, when they became Christians, they tried to turn them into Jews. They were Judaizers. And so they had come behind Paul, and they said, listen, Paul, you know, Paul has shared some good things with you, but he's not shared the whole truth with you. We are now here to share the rest of the truth with you. And so they begin to teach them the law, and they begin to tell them, you know, it starts with, you need to get circumcised. Because if you don't get circumcised, you don't have a covenant with God. Oh, wow. Well, now that's pretty serious if you're talking about heaven and hell. And so this is why Paul is telling them. He said, he set you free to be free. You gave up your paganism. Now you're going to change your paganism for being religious? You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna trade this living, wonderful relationship with Jesus Christ to, you know, to, to just become a religious person, to, be, to become a Jew? Is that what you're going to do? He said, don't let anybody else put a harness of slavery on you. Don't let them tell you you've got to be circumcised. Don't let them tell you you've got to keep all the feasts and, and, you know, and, and, and all the holidays. Uh, 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 don't let them tell you, you, you know, that you, you know, you've got to be a, a law keeper. And listen, I believe in the commandments. Don't, don't misunderstand me. I keep the commandments because I love God because Jesus Christ saved me. I don't keep the commandments so I get to go to heaven. You understand the difference? There's a difference. Yeah. The root word for religion is this. It comes from a Latin word, religer, which means to bind back or to tie back. And that's if they were not careful, that is exactly what happens when one gets, you know, has, they've gotten saved and now they've gotten religious. It binds them back. It ties them back. Oh, probably many people probably struggle with this after having become a Christian. Again, to, to bind back, to, to tie back. I posed a question last week. I'll, I'll do it again, but I won't spend as much time on it this week. You know, what does it mean to fall from grace? And for years, I thought to fall from grace, that, it was, the, that was the fallen ministers back in the, you know, in the uh, uh, late 1980s. Those men fell from grace. Now listen, what they, what they did was they did sin, and, and they missed it, and and we'll not throw their names out. I, I said one of their names last week, and I wished I had not And so, uh, uh, you know, they sinned. And their sin was public, and it was shameful, and it was, it was, it was difficult. And, and there were people who quit following God because of it. Of course, you can, you can say, you know, well, listen, that's it's pretty shallow. You know, who were you following? Were you following them, or were you following Jesus? You know, I don't have any plans to fail, but if I do fail, don't give up on Jesus. All right, I'm making no plans, all right? Miss June would take care of it if I did. Okay. Galatians 5, 3 and 4. I testify again to every man to become circumcised that he's a debtor to keep the whole law. You've become a, listen, you separate yourself from Christ. Anytime you add anything else to being saved, you separate yourself from Christ. That's, that's, I, I, would, I would be very reluctant, whatever group I belong to, to say, you know, you've got to become X, Y, or Z or you're not a Christian. They're telling them. He's saying, listen, you, you know, you, you, you become, you're separating yourself from Christ. Don't do that. You're, you're attempting to be justified. What? Through some other means. Now, what's he talking about? Here he's talking about legalism. All right? 
legal when he says you've fallen from grace fallen from grace is when a christian turns to religion and becomes a legalist and you've what you've fallen from grace we're no longer dependent upon the grace of god no longer dependent upon him had a family member you know that did bad in his life he messed up he'd been saved and but just made a big mess you know and and uh, and so anyway, you know, people had all these reasons that he needed to get it right. Look at look at how you've embarrassed your brother. They were speaking of me. Look at how you've embarrassed your brother. Look what you've done to the church you're going to. And listen, that was all true. But the truth is, it was only one thing that was important. What are you doing to your relationship with Jesus? That's what was important. What are you doing with your relationship with Jesus? Let's get that restored. Let's get that fixed. Let's get that healed. All right? Soon we depend upon other things. Depend upon other things. I, I'm, I, I respect the different traditions within the church world. If somebody sprinkles, that is not, that's not my preference. But listen, I, I, that's, the, uh, that's the actions. That's the participation in their faith. Their faith is in Christ. You know, my faith is not in whether or not I've been sprinkled or whether or not I've been dunked or whether I've done it in a baptistry or I did it at the river. I, you know, we're identifying with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And so, again, well, if you don't take communion like us, well, listen, just I, I would encourage people, you know, be gracious. You know, if we do communion different than you, be gracious to us. You do great communion. Listen, we're practicing communion. Wouldn't you say that that is the important thing, whether or not we're practicing communion? Whether or not we're honoring his sacrifice, the brokenness of his body, the shedding of his blood? Whether we do it with one cup, two cups, ten cups, or a hundred cups? One loaves, two loaves, or wafers? We're doing what? We're doing communion. See, we can always unite. I like uniting around the things you can unite around. I said I wouldn't spend much time there. Any attempt, here I say an attempt, to be guiltless without receiving the gift of Christ. That's what it means to fall from grace. Any attempt to be guiltless without receiving the gift of Christ, the gift of his sacrifice. That's what it means to fall from grace. Trying to find another way. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace we've been what saved? Aren't you glad for that? For by grace you've what been saved? He gave us what we did not deserve. D. James Kennedy, grace, I'll remember this. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. That's a great definition. God's, G, riches are at, C, Christ's expense. That's what grace is. For grace you've been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's not of works. Least anyone should boast. Second Timothy three five, and having a form, we've circled that word, a form of godliness. The word form comes from the, the Greek word, an appearance or a facade. A facade. Well, there's a gr there's a great picture out in the hallway. Uh, 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 Tanya and Daniel and uh, you know primarily built it, but one year at Christmas we did this certain thing, and we got this clock up here, and I'm telling you, at 30 feet it looks real. I mean, you walk by the hallway and look at that huge clock behind me, you know, and you golly, what a big clock they got! In there. But it's just a facade, right? It's not a re it didn't tick and it didn't talk, you know. It was right twice a day. Yeah, that's all some of us are right. Right, just kidding, just kidding. Don't take it personal. It's right twice a day. Yeah, it's just a facade. But I'm I, again, if you look at the picture, I goodness, it it's sharp. It it looks like it, you know, it looks it looks real. But it's what, it's, it's a facade. You know, you watch it. You know, you watch Star Wars. My goodness, you know. But I, that's all. What it's it's just a facade. It's it's not real. It's entertaining though. I'm I'm not against the entertainment value. You know, if you know something's a facade, it's, 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 it's all good. 
Hey, you know, when we as kids, we used to watch that, we used to watch wrestling. This is years before WWF, years before WWF, you know. And, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, <clears throat> but it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, the same kind of stuff. And I'm telling you, I, I had friends, they would fight you over whether or not that's real. Now I'd say, come on, you kill people when you hit them with chairs. <laughs> And people die when you do that kind of stuff. Now, that's not to say those guys aren't athletic. Oh, they're great athletes. And do they get hurt? Oh, my. Yeah, by the time they're 40 years old, they're nearly crippled. They're great athletes. Great. And they're great, they're great performers. And are they strong? I wouldn't, get in, I wouldn't get in a tussle with none of them. All right? So I'd be pretty careful looking at one of them in the face and saying what you're doing is fake. Okay? All right? But the truth is, there's a tremendous amount of entertainment value in it. We, we get that. Yeah. Get the crowd going and everything. Well, it's, it's, it, it's a facade. Gosh, and I'm going to have somebody send me a note somewhere because they love wrestling. And they <laughs> Matthew 23, 27. Woe unto you, teachers of the law, Pharisees, hypocrites. I, I, I do want you to notice this. All right? We use the term hypocrite much more loosely than Jesus did. Think about this. We use it much more loosely than Jesus did. The only time Jesus ever used it was with religious leadership. It's the only time was with religious leadership. But when do you teachers of law, hypocrites? You're like whitewashed tombs. You look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, he said, you're full of dead men's bones. There's no life within. But it looks good on the outside. Everything's what? It's just unclean. Hypocrite, once again, one of them, it's a great Greek word, and, and it's derived from the Greek word, hypocrites, meaning a, a deceiver. It was, it was a word that they used, it, I mean, it would have been an everyday, it would have been like us saying actor. That's, that's how common the word would have been. They would have said actor. Uh, that's why I've always had trouble. I was at a youth camp one time, and I was putting the camp on, and I had some guys dressed up like girls, and they were full-grown men. I want you to know I set them back to change. They thought it was funny. And I said, you know, we got young, impressionable men here, and we are not going to let you macho guys do that. Because they were. They were real macho guys. You know, no, you know. Uh, but here's my deal. All right. It means a deceiver. It's a, it's a performer. All right. It's a pretender under a mask. And I'm not talking about masks. You know, in the way, you know, can't even, you know, I hate when things happen in the culture because then you can't even get where you can talk about them right. And, uh, you know, Mardi Gras, and, uh, you know, very old tradition comes from, you know, comes from Europe. And, uh, of course, it's popularized, you know, by, uh, by Mardi Gras, you know, down in, uh, uh, um, in New Orleans and Fat Tuesday and things. But Fat Tuesday goes all the way back to Europe. And, and what they would do is that they, they had this period of time, but, you know, before, you know, before, uh, you know, Easter and, and, and before Lent, and, and they would put on these masks and listen to it, just how, how bad. It was the only time that the rich and the poor would intermingle. They'd put on masks. Because other times they didn't. And, uh, uh, and then... They also put on those masks so they could just practice all sorts of debauchery and supposedly nobody know who was performing. So the rich and the poor intermingled, the, you know, the, the educated and the uneducated, the, the, the different ethnic groups. And, and so they, they would put on a, a mask, uh, you know, and endeavoring to what? To, to deceive. Again, a performer, uh, uh, somebody who's pretending beneath a mask. Now, when we become Christians, you know, the, you know, we become, when Christians become religious, the mask tends to cover up who Christ is in our lives. And this is the most important thing there is. You know, everybody's met somebody that was, you know, they were, they were being enorm enormously kind, but the kindness was a facade. It was fake. It was phony. It wasn't real. Uh, you, you know, somebody was enormously caring, but they didn't really care. It was just, it was just fake. It was phony. It, was, it, it wasn't real. And, and if we're not careful, we, again, after getting saved, we don't want to put something else on, all right, whatever it might be. All right? Some rigidness, some legalism. 
and put that mask on it and cover up Christ in our lives. Reflecting Him. We're made in the image of God, the Imagio Dei. We sure don't want to cover that up. Wearing a mask is, a, is attempting to do, do this. It's attempting to be lights in the community, but sometimes be in darkness at home. On the outside, it's white. It looks good. But what's it like at home? See, when we're not being religious, we'll, we'll be the same person. doesn't mean we're a perfect person either way. But I know this. When I don't pretend, it forces me to deal with who Bill is. And I'm glad to do it. I'm grateful to do it. Let's keep going. John 8, 32 says, You shall know the truth. I love, this is one of my favorite verses, and I got lots of them, just like you do. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I love this verse. And on one hand, you know, you say the truth is the thoughts, the ideas, the answers, the insights, the divine secrets. And I'd say yes. But more specifically, you shall know the truth, I believe, is talking about a person. It's a person. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. The truth is what? A person. It's Christ. So if you know Christ, then Christ will what? Make you free. The nearer that we stay to the truth, the closer we'll stay to freedom. You know, you can even fall in love with freedom. To such a point that you, you know, Paul says, don't use your freedom as an occasion to the flesh. And I've, I've seen good Christian people, and, and they, the last thing in the world they wanted to do was be called religious. Oh, my goodness, they didn't want to be called religious. And, you know, and, you know, and they would be the ones, you know, that throw out all the religious trappings. You know, you don't have a cross, and you don't have an altar, and you don't have a pulpit. And you, you just get rid of all that religious trapping because we're free. And listen, I believe in freedom. Jesus said, I, I set you free to be free. But now you've got your whole new set of trappings. What's the difference? All right? If you trade your pulpit for a stool. You don't, share, you don't shave and you don't tuck your shirt in. You've just traded your religious trappings. It's all the same. Uh, be who you are. If, if, if not shaving and not tucking your shirt in, you know, and you're a preacher and that turned, you know, you, that, that, you know that's who you are, I, I'm good, you know. I can't imagine what it was like to see John the Baptist come walking out of the wilderness, you know. Camel skin, eating locusts and honey. I, he had to be a wild thing to see. Okay. I, yeah, I'm convinced. One of the great stories, uh, you know, that, that uh, uh, <clears throat> leadership guy, I hate when I do that in front of people, Maxwell. John Maxwell is going to Florida. He's going to speak for a, for a minister. Large, large church down there. Minister's son comes to pick him up. Here's, here's, here's a, this is a great story, man. And, uh, uh, and, and so nonetheless, he sends, his, he sends his son. And when he sees his son, John says, I know why he sent his son. You know, because this kid's got, you know, he's, he's, you know his, his head's kind of shaved on one side. It's colored and combed over to the other. He's got a got an earring, he's, you know, he's, he's got tattoos, and I'm, I'm not the tattoo guy, I'm, I'm, I'm not the guy looking to straighten people out, but John's, you know, it's not my deal, I, but this is John's deal, John knows why pastor sent his son, so he can witness to him, so he jumps in the car, and he says, before I could even get started, this kid says, oh, Brother John, man, I just got back from Europe. We saw 300 kids saved. And, you know, and see, he's talking about all this stuff that they did on the streets and the lives getting changed and praying for people. And, 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 and John felt ashamed. Because, now, you've got to be careful. We don't look at somebody and say, oh, they're a phony. No, the kid was a real deal. He loved God. Had a heart for him. Had a heart for him. And I think John was, he's, he's a good one. I, I, I like, some people don't like John Maxwell. I like John. He's encouraged me in my life. And uh, I like that. Some people say, oh, I don't like that Maxwell stuff. Well, it's all right, you know. I do, and we can still love each other. <clears throat> you shall know the truth, and, and in truth, what shall make you free? You know, John got liberated that day. You know what John was struggling with? Listen, we all have, we all have opportunities to do it. John got religious on himself. His religion spilled out a little bit. Listen. 
And I'm, I'm very capable of doing that. I'm not going to throw too big a stone. I have just got through saying, yeah, he's been an encouragement to me. And I appreciate the transparency of sharing that on himself. Yeah, he shared that on himself. You should know the truth, and the truth should make you free. Again, you talk about getting religious. Paul Young Cho, pastor of the largest church in the world. He had a meeting one time. It was in Sweden. And he brought down kids that was blind. I mean, it, was, it was astounding. He was like 11. 11 kids that were blind. They brought them down. Pastor Cho prayed for them. And all 11 kids got healed. Now John thinks, Pastor Cho thinks, my goodness, this is my deal. He's praying for the blind. He said, I got to another building. He said they had a whole group of blind children in it. You know, he's, he's a renowned pastor. Thousands and thousands come to listen to him. There's a whole group. There's about 24, 25 blind kids. He brought them up. He's going to pray for them because God's going to heal them all. Listen, I believe in healing. I'm talking about getting religious right now. Right? I believe in healing. He brought them children down. About halfway through, nobody got healed. He got embarrassed and left the stage. You know what happened? He got a little religious. Got a little religious. Now, again, you know what I like about him? Transparency transparency it's always easy it's always easy to say who else is doing it wrong and how good I'm doing it yeah how good I'm doing it stay close to Jesus when you know the truth what is the truth the truth has set you free and we get to this place all right so I won't get much further but I won't come much I won't go back further than this next time differences between Christianity and religion religion says this we know the truth we know the truth you say, well, that's what we say. No, no, it's not what we say. You're not going to say what the Bible says. You can know the truth. You can know the truth. The aim of religion is to control behavior and thinking. The purpose of Christianity is to see the nature of men changed. To see the nature of men changed. See, because the truth is you can't impact behavior and thinking until nature changes. I, you know, I mean, we can get everybody to pretend and to act alike for a little while. I, you know, you think, you think about Paul. Paul was a religious zealot. I mean, he was a scholar, too. He knew the law. And I'm certain he used the law to justify persecuting the saints. He was Saul before he was Paul. And so these, once again, you've got this new sect that's among them. And we're going to, listen, listen to me. All right? Religion, listen to me, religion always persecutes the most recent move of God. Yeah. We talk about the Great Awakening. And I, you know, and Jonathan Edwards was, a, was one of the leading figures of the Great Awakening. He, he died very young. He was not very old. And I think he was in his late 40s when Jonathan Edwards passed. He was, he was a brilliant man, loved God. And, but back then, you know, you, you don't think about these things. But, but, if you, but again, you, you know, you, I've been in there and I've read a lot of that stuff. And the traditional community called them the new lights, okay? The awakening people called them the old lights. And there, oh, was not good if their paths did cross. And we're talking about what? We're talking about a spiritual awakening, yet the, 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 those that were religious, oh, they despised it. They were way too emotional. They were fanatics. Way too demonstrative. And I'm certain probably by today's standards, probably not much. Probably not much. But now we look back in history and we call it the first great awakening. But the same was true with the, the second great awakening. And has it has continued to be true down through the, the years. I'll tell this and I'll come to a close. Some years ago that... Uh, there was a revival in Brownsville, uh, in Brownsville, Florida. 
And uh, we'd been praying as a church, and I mean, at that point, uh, we'd been praying, you know, uh, two or three times every week, you know, every week. And, uh, you know, we prayed Tuesday morning, Tuesday night, and then we, uh, we prayed sometimes on Saturday night, and then we committed every Sunday night to it. So sometimes it was as upwards of four times a week. And we prayed. We prayed for people to get saved, and we prayed for revival. We did that for five years. And so anyway, in, 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 in the course of that time, I, I, uh, I'd heard about Brownsville, and, and it just kind of went on, came on my radar, went off. And we're in Florida, and we're vacationing. And I wanted to spend a day on the beach. I got my family. It's the first time we've been on a vacation in years and years. We just finished this building program, this expansion right here. And so the church sent us on a vacation. And, and so I want to spend a day on the beach. And, and so I take my family. We're in Tampa. We're on the worst beach in Tampa. It's a terrible beach. Not the church's fault. I made the arrangements. Not the church's fault. St. Peter, well, same thing, St. Petersburg, Tampa. But you are right. It was St. Petersburg. So it was the worst beach in St. Petersburg. Uh, which probably couldn't have matched anything as bad in Tampa. And, uh, I mean, there was seaweed, the sand. You, you almost had to chip the sand. It was, it was not good. We went up and swam in the pool. And uh, so anyway, so I go to, we go to the hotel room, and I got Charisma Magazine, you know, and I'm reading Charisma Magazine. And it's talking about the Brownsville Revival. And the more I read, the more excited I'm getting. And it dawns on me, here I am, I'm sitting in St. Petersburg, Florida. We could, be, we could be in Brownsville right now. What am I doing in St. Petersburg, Florida? Well, I'm telling you what, I, we're, I, we're packing up, we're going. And then I figure out, it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and it's a four-hour drive. I can't get there. And so I, you know, I said that we came home, finished our vacation, had a great time. It was a wonderful time for our family, wonderful time for our family. And, uh, and I got up in the pulpit and said, I said, listen, all right, and, and uh, this is going to sound, you know, kind of unbelief, but you, you, you follow me. Right? I always tell people, you know, sometimes I'm telling things just like they are. All right, when I'm standing in faith, I'll let you know, but otherwise I'm telling things like they are. So anyway, I said, you know, if you can catch a cold, and I'm never believing God to catch a cold, you understand. I said, if you can catch a cold, surely you can catch revival. I'm going to Brownsville, Florida. Who's going with me? And I think 12 of us went, Miss Cheryl. And we went down to Brownsville, Florida, and I'm telling you what now. They w w we weren't Assembly God Church. They were. I went. I'm telling you from that time forward. And eventually, the Lord sent us a black woman evangelist to Texas County. I love it. I love it. A black woman evangelist. My goodness. We had 246 first-time decisions, but it all went back to what? To go into that revival. And God changed what? He changed the nature of people. Boy, I saw it happen there. My goodness, they had people saved night after night. I, I, now, this is where I come to. I got to a point where I had friends. I wouldn't even tell them I went to Brownsville because, you know what? It wasn't their camp. And they didn't, they didn't, that wasn't God. Well, listen, excuse me for the 246 people that got born again. Yeah. Here in Houston, Missouri, we had people come from 67 different zip codes. That revival went on for 18 weeks. Part of the miracle was this church was able to show up and do it for 18 weeks. Isn't that right, Jan? Yeah, yeah. Very proud of our church family. Very proud of our church family. And it was, it was an extraordinary time. We did see the blind see. We seen lame people walk. Um, we had, listen, if this guy could flip that switch, he'd flip it again today. And, uh, but here's, here's my deal. We saw it. We experienced it. And I had friends that criticized it. Criticized it. You know why? Because we always get religious. And if, if it's not us, it can't be God. Listen. God's not us. He's not us. God loves, he loves the Baptists and the Methodists and the non-denominational and the denominational. He loves them all. They're his people. They're all part of his family and all part of his kingdom. And he can work as he will. You know? 
Uh, listen, I was, I was thrilled. I was thrilled for the influence and for what that did in our, the life of our church and in my life personally. And, and, uh, but I can tell you, I saw what religion could do to something, even there in their own church. They went to the pastor and they said, listen, they just built a brand new beautiful building. And it was a beautiful facility. Just built a brand new beautiful facility. They walked into the uh, board meeting one day with all the blueprints. And they tried to explain to the pastor how revival was going to destroy the plumbing in the church. I, you, I'm not kidding you. Why? Because God was moving and they didn't like what God was doing. They liked it better when they could sing three, listen, and there's seasons. There's seasons where you, you know, you sing three hymns and preach a message and you give an invitation and you, you work, you work the field as hard as you can and you go home. And you keep doing that until something happens. But see, that they wanted to keep doing that. Even if God started doing something different, I will tell you this, God does something new, this boy will be on it. And I trust you'll be on it too. Can you say amen? So I'm believing, you know. Before revival, I used to say this, Lord, David said, revive us again. I said, Lord, you're no respecter of persons. We've not been revived. I'm believing for revival. Well, today I pray differently. Lord, I pray like David did. Revive us again, O oh Lord. Can you say amen? We're going to come to a close. Father, I thank you for your word, how wonderful it is, how good it is, how good you are. And I'm so grateful, Father, that you just love the family of God. I'm so grateful, Father, that you've been patient with me and with so many of us. Because, Lord, that sometimes we look around and we, and we think that we're the only ones. But, Lord, you've got a great big family, and we're proud of it. We're glad to be a part of it and help us to respect one another and love one another. And, and Lord, and, and just rally around the good things that we do agree on and not always get caught on... Catch our toe, Father, on the things that, you know, that uh, maybe we don't agree on, but we still do on the big things. Lord, I thank you. I love you so much. Help me, Father, to, to not get religious. Help me not to shun the things that you're doing and say that's not God. Lord, I'm, I'm not going to be one that's going to judge one of your servants or, or what you're doing. Father, help me to be as, as wise as the, you know, as the as a Jewish leader who said if, it, if it's not of God it will come to nothing and if it is God who are we to resist it so I thank you Father for all that you're doing in our lives Father we're looking for Father people's lives to be changed their nature to be changed and we want to be a part of that we thank you for these things in Jesus name Amen God bless you